The panel is scaling up a growth stage investing roundtable. And with that, I'm just going to hand it over to our moderator, John Savelson. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for attending. Real pleasure to be here, and, and thanks to LSI for uh, putting on a, a great event. We've got some esteemed colleagues here on stage, and I'm hoping to just give us a little bit of direction as we're trying to uh, talk about uh, growth stage investing, the state of the state of play right now, what to be thinking about, and um, looking forward to the conversation. We'll we'll leave ten or fifteen minutes at the end, really, if I can monitor my own uh, my own time to to take questions. So please uh, please uh, keep those, or you can call you can ask any time. But we, we'd sure love to have some participation from from those in the audience. So. Just introductions, uh, you know, John, you want to just introduce yourself and Dan, and then, then we'll get going. Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name's John Ryan. I've been a venture capital and private equity investor in healthcare for a little over 20 year, 25 years now um, with J.P. Morgan, then uh, with Onset Ventures, and now uh, with Wells Fargo Strategic Capital. Um, I do various things in my spare time. One example is I'm on the board of directors of Sutter Health, um, which is a good way to kind of stay on top of what's going on with the hospitals and, and provider side of the business. Um, at Wells Fargo Strategic Capital, we're, uh, you can think of us like as the uh, direct investing business for Wells Fargo. So we make direct investments into companies. We have uh, divisions that focus on other industries, but um, uh, of course one in healthcare. And in healthcare, we invest in all sectors of healthcare. Um, we generally invest between five and fifty million dollars per transaction. Uh, we spend a little more time on equity investing, uh, but we can provide debt capital as well. So we do both equity uh, and debt uh, investing. And uh, in terms of our role, we um, usually lead a syndicate of investors, but we can follow another lead or be a solo investor as well. And uh, from a stage perspective, we're looking to invest in commercial stage companies. So for companies that have, uh, are more in the life sciences areas, like medical devices, diagnostics, life science tools, et cetera, we're looking for companies that have FDA approved products that are commercially available, and then any stage later than that. And for healthcare services and healthcare information technology, we're looking for companies that have five to $10 million of revenue traction. And again, any stage later than, <clears throat> than that. So we've invested in companies so far that range from about $5 million to about a billion dollars in revenue. Hi, good afternoon. Dan Nicholson with Jeffries, a senior vice president covering MedTech. I'm based in New York. I've been with the firm 12 years. Before that, I spent some time at KPMG and CR Bard. It's good to be with you. And um, I'm John Salveson. I'm uh, vice chairman at Piper Sandler. I've uh, uh, started my career in med tech and then lost my way into finance 30 years at Piper really started my career covering uh, med tech uh, ended up opening our offices in a few places around the world uh, ended up running our healthcare group ran global investment banking across the entire enterprise and today in the role of vice chairman and I chair our healthcare investment banking group with about 150 members. So great to be with you here. I thought I'd just make a couple comments to kind of set the stage as to where we stand today in the med tech uh, market. I think I'll have Dan kind of speak a little bit about maybe the, the overall economic, uh, you know, the, the economics condition right now. But with regard to med tech, I think we've gone through a decade of incredible growth. Uh, growth in in revenues and growth in um, markets and growth in valuation. If you've been around a long time, uh, you kind of monitor the temperature of valuation growth companies over the first two and a half decades of my career would not it would not be uh, untrue to say they kind of traded in a range of four to six times forward revenue. They were taken out at premiums to those valuations, and it was a bit of a sine wave for about 25 years, and something happened in the middle of the last decade where we started to see valuations creep up. They started to creep up to seven, then to nine, then to 11. And we're looking at our, our partnership and saying, you know, what, what is this with valuations? I think some of that can be definitely attributed to lower cost of capital, but there's other things at play, which was, you know, clearly liquidity. Uh, COVID put uh, almost overnight uh, 
you know, negative on on valuations. Va values on, in March of 2020 traded down 40 percent, but then rocketed to new heights. And we had every company in the world growing in the med tech space more than 15 percent uh, year on year, trading on average at 16 times forward revenue. Kind of non-economic in its value. And so where does that stand today? It stands at six times. So we've had a complete reversion. And I think sometimes if you're not watching, you don't realize that we've had this incredible run up and today run, you know, it's kind of run back to maybe more historic standards. So what that does is last year, after a record IPO year in 2021, we had zero IPOs in the US last year in the med tech space. m and which I don't think is all market driven, but there was half the M&A done from the prior year and really the lowest year in the last decade. So we've got, obviously for investors, when you have, you know, this is cyclical. I don't think there's anything that's permanent about it, but when you have less um, realizations, I think it just puts a lot more scrutiny on how uh, investors put their money to work. And, and now I think we come into into 2023. So that's a little bit of the backdrop that we're talking about for growth stage private uh, med tech companies. And, and Dan, maybe you want to kind of just give a little bit. I have a bit question of, for you, John. I'm yeah. just curious. When, when do companies switch from a revenue multiple to an EBITDA <laughs> multiple? Well, about the last year. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a, I mean, fit, we're that's in a the very life good cycle. comment because, because what we saw is just a direct line of, of revenue and revenue growth being the only metric of Evaluation and those lines have crossed a little bit. What you've seen is the growth and profitable companies uh, almost having double the uh, the market returns over the last 18 months to pure revenue growth. So uh, I think you know that's an indication of lower valuations, cost of money's more expensive, but. Um, uh, look, I, I don't think growth is the name of the game, and it will continue to be. We're just, I think, in an environment where where people have stopped and said, hey, "Wait a minute!" I think bottom line actually has some, you know, ha has a lot of meaning. So, Dan, maybe you know the broader context. Yeah, no, I, I think that those are uh, points are right on. Um, so, I, I think just generally, if you look at the market backdrop, a lot of headlines. Um, it, it's been a really tough environment. Um, you know, no IPOs last year. This year, we were hoping that the second half of the year we'd see a return to IPOs. Um, but you know, the news out of the banking sector has obviously left things pretty challenged, and um, investors are, are keeping their monies on the sideline. Um, I think, in terms of the bright spots, though, um, th there, there's a couple points here. One, I think, for folks who are looking to partner with strategics, they're always very well capitalized, and now. You go you're from 16 times forward trading uh, multiples to, to six. Everything seems like it's a discount. So uh, there's a ton of enthusiasm there. Those VC f funds, um, you know, they've, they've raised a ton of capital over the last two and a half years. So I think those folks are well capitalized. I, I think on balance, though, you need to uh, check more boxes. Um, stories need to be a little bit more developed than what's the, what they once were and what you know, at least on the deal side, what we're seeing is, um, you know, what used to take three conversations is now taking six. So the, the timelines are, 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 are getting longer. But I think just generally speaking within med tech, uh, healthcare broadly, it's such a huge part of the economy. It's generally known to be very resistant, uh, resilient. And, uh, you know, I, I think in terms of, of capital available, it's still there. It's just going to take folks a longer time and valuation pressure. You're going to continue to see that. But uh, in terms of ability to raise capital, um, you know, we're, we're still pretty bullish on folks being able to get deals done just at a slower pace and a more modest valuation. Maybe we could just go into just the categories. Where does the where does the capital reside? And, you know, for growth investing, um, John, maybe, you know, you know, by the way, Dan and I only move money. John has it, so afterwards, you know, just we'll let you speak with him. Uh, John, what yeah, but you, you guys go to a whole bunch of investors, and I'm only one investor. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, just teasing. So, what what do you see as the climate for the venture capital bucket in terms of 
growth investing. And what any observations? Yeah, it's really difficult right now, as which is you know obvious thanks to any everybody. But um, but yeah, uh, fundraising is always difficult, and it's particularly difficult now. Um, you know, the good news for us with the, the fact that the IPOs aren't happening is that means those companies now need expansion, you know, private expansion capital, so more opportunities for an investor that has a strategy like we do. Um, the uh, still, having said that, uh, given the downturn in the market, I think um, all venture capital, private equity type investors are uh, being very cautious right now. So there are some investors that aren't, really aren't investing. There's um, few investors will say that they're not investing because they, you know, they want to keep the deal flow up and all that. They don't want to be perceived as being out of the market. Some of them in reality, you know, are probably out of the market for the time being. Um, and the investors that are investing are, are being cautious. I think you know, we all know that investing through a down cycle uh, makes sense uh, from uh, from a strategy perspective, but there's a difference between, you know, investing kind of through the down cycle versus catching a falling knife. And I think, you know, we're currently in an environment where it's kind of unclear where the markets are going to settle out. And so that's got um, people being, uh, you know, quite cautious. So there's not nothing happening. So, um, you know, you, you can raise money, but... Uh, you know, it's a challenge, and it'll just take longer and, and more effort. Yeah, Dan, I don't know what your perspective is, and, you know, we could talk about the entire spectrum of investing, but, you know, we've had processes for med tech companies recently where we've gone to 100 investors. <laughs> and if I had to characterize it, you wouldn't be surprised that, you know, it's, it's we're, we invest only early, we invest only late, and not many people want to invest kind of in the middle. So I think for growth, you know, commercialization, the commercialization capital, I think it that probably comes back or it's it's a, probably a better spot. That mama bear position where you're going into clinicals is is a really tough spot. And so, uh, you know, that y you can expect out of 100, you're going to get 90 of those answers. It's I'm going early, I'm going late. And um, but I think well, and that you're probably seeing what kind of something I was talking about a minute ago, which is there's some investors that in reality are not investing, but you know they don't want to just say we're not investing. Yeah. So instead, yeah, they're just it's always too early or too late or you know whatever. <laughs> well, fair point, yeah. Dan, Dan. Any thoughts there on, on the VC side? Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's spot on. Um, I think that's also part of what happened with uh, 2020 and 2021, right, where there was just uh, an excess of capital, right. Um, I think you could almost call it free money for a large portion of time, which is why you saw this huge spike up in the SPAC market um, where there's just all these various different alternatives to investing. So um, there, there was naturally an exodus or a, a lack of need for that, that in-betweener in terms of that growth capital where it's yeah. somewhere between zero and $10 million of revenue. Um, there was, you know, really early stage folks who could be with a company for 10 to 15 years and then folks who are ready to write a check for a crossover and want to take you public immediately. So I think, you know, just as, as the, the capital cycle changes and where money's needed, uh, that'll continue to evolve. And, you know, folks tend to be, you know, uh, I, I think all of us, we sometimes we're a little prisoner of the moment, but, you know, w with that, we could also be pretty flexible in our, our viewpoint. And uh, I think VCs are going to start to do the same thing. I think there's also dynamic, there's trends that happen in all of healthcare, but uh, there's also trends that happen within sectors. So, you know, biotech is different from medical devices, different from healthcare services, et cetera. And the, in medical devices specifically, it's been a really tough, what, decade or something. You know, there was a very robust community of venture capital investors in the medical device space in the kind of 1990s, you know, up into the 2000s through 2010 or something. And then, you know, we uh, ran into a lot of difficulty with the FDA and reimbursement and the um, medical device venture community evaporated. I mean, you know, the vast majority of firms that had been investing in medical device companies um, don't exist anymore or you know, or they're kind of just managing out their old funds or whatever. And so the number of possible investors out there is just a lot smaller. I think there's some people that are coming back into the market now, and, you know, hopefully we see that uh, come back. But um, but we're still we're still really not out of that. So, like, when you say you go to 100 investors, the, what enters my mind is, you know, wow, I'm surprised there's 100 investors to go to. <laughs> Uh, we made that up. No, uh, no. Uh, well, let's talk about corporates then. I mean, maybe my perspective there um, quickly would be across the med tech landscape. Um, 
my guess is half have very, very active venture and investing programs. Some of them are very, very good at it. Uh, I think the other half are just waiting to get into it because I, you know, they're not there altruistically. They they invest around themes that are important to them, uh, but they're very, very good investors. And I think you know they they recognize their role if they're if they're asking companies to get further along in their development. Uh, they're you know, in fact, uh, what I said is you know today in the M and A market, you you better have a bow on it, like. They don't want dilution. They don't want the risk. You got to deliver it when they want it, when they can really lever it against their own balance sheet. So, you know, a good friend of mine, I don't know if he's in the room, but said last night, when I got into this job in corporate development at, at a, you know, a strategic, he said, I thought I, I, thought I was going to be doing M&A. But, you know, t a large percentage of what we do is is strategic investing. And, and I think they're for growth, uh, I think that's that's one of they've been, and I did, they're not going away. They're they're well capitalized. Yeah, I think that's a really good option in medical devices as opposed to other areas of healthcare. I think the strategics are really good investors and 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 good partners in that way. I think the other thing that's really important is if you are raising money um, to hear the point um, that John was making about valuations. You know, the, the world has changed and valuations are different now. So. Um, if you go, to, we, we all the time, you know, hear from people that say like, hey, we'll give you a great deal. You can do, you know, a, uh, an investment at the same valuation as our last round and it was in 2021 at the, what'd you say, 16 times revenue, um, which, you know, that's not an attractive valuation, even if that was your last valuation. And so when investors um, think that there's a mismatch on valuation, frequently you just say, well, I've got you know, 20 things to work on and I'm busy and, you know, I, I just won't spend my time on that one. So I think it's um, prudent to go in with um, reasonable valuation expectations up front. Well, and we, we talked about it, the three of us. I, I, I've just become pretty straightforward with the companies we work with that um, look around you. When valuations are down 64% for growth, comp growth med tech companies, when you know there has been a reset, probably in your own personal account, to just hold your breath and look at your other board members and think, hmm, uh, maybe it didn't happen to us. That is a bad place to start your private placement process. I think there's a, one of the best things you can do, and it's hard to have a valuation conversation amongst two people. It's really hard amongst six. But you got to have it because nothing gets done well in six to nine months. You need to go out to the market, embrace what the market is delivering in terms of messages, and and rip the Band-Aid off and get your financing done. you got to have gas in the tank in this environment because there are no gas stations along the way potentially. So I, I, I think we've been really, from an advisory standpoint, trying to be really honest with our clients about that because just – the slow drip of next month going, oh, maybe we'll accept that, and the next month, maybe we'll accept that. That is a, you know, everyone in this room knows how that goes, and it is not productive because you will lose people along the way that are legitimate investors. Yeah, you know, I think the other thing that got lost during 2020 and 2021 with just excess capital was when you're raising a growth round, there's, there's qualities other than cash in the door that are important to you, right? Whether it's a strategic, do they have an angle, and can they actually help you with the other board members in terms of getting into certain institutions, right? Centers of excellence for your, for your trial. Um, you know, does a VC firm, or, you know, do they have that KOL network that can open up doors for you, help commercial ramp? Um, those things I, I think generally got lost because valuations just kept growing and growing where people, you know, instead of selling on qualities outside of the capital in the door, that kind of took a back seat and whatever the highest valuation was that, you know, they won, and it, it's hard to do that when multiples are 16 plus times, right? Because everyone's dilution, dilution sensitive. But I, I think as we enter this next phase, you know, kind of the softer qualities are going to become more important. Other other types of investors, John, you've seen, you know, uh, family offices, well, sovereigns, kind of, other other sources. Yeah, there's like the institutional investors we talked about, and then the. Um, uh, uh, the strategic sink are a good option. And then, of course, there's like family offices. And I think that can be a great option. Um, 
I, I uh, uh, haven't worked with a lot of the family offices, uh, so I don't have a, a great list for you at this point, but I know I talked to a lot of companies that raise money from family offices and seem to have a relatively good experience with that. And in particular in healthcare, I think, or medical devices, uh, there's a lot, of, well, all of us have health issues, and so we can relate to healthcare. And uh, I think there's a lot of uh, kind of family office type investors out there that care about certain disease states or, you know, other things or just doing good in the world and helping people and all that. And so I think if you can tell them a story about, um, you know, the good that you're doing uh, in addition to making good returns, I think family offices are a good option. Uh, let's talk insiders for a second. I think one of the one of the preparations for a financing, too, is making sure your insider is in the right spot. May, you know, they they need to play a very strong role. And the best med tech investors do this extremely well, where they go into these processes with a show of strength because nobody, I'm sure, John, you get the call and you ask that question, you do not want the grand ole, you know, where where somebody's trying to pass, you, you know, the, the, the baton to you. How do you how do you evaluate that? Because I think insiders are really crucial in in growth stage investing. Well, one option, one thing is just to have uh, uh, existing investors that can support the company over time. So if you're in a fortunate enough position to be able to choose your investors, then choose investors that are going to you think are going to have dry powder for future financings, and you know uh, so that when we get to a point like this, then your uh, existing investors can continue to finance the business. So just. Uh, over the last several days, and I was just on a call right before this panel, uh, working on a financing for one of our portfolio companies that will likely just include insiders and not a new investor currently. Um, so that can be, you know, a great source of, uh, of capital for sure. And, and it's obvious, but you know, it's. I think the you know interested in new investors want to hear from them. So it's not only showing that support, but picking up the phone. And, and having that conversation, say, we love this company. This is where we're driving it to. Here's our plan. You know, just being completely in sync with, with you know, the management is really important because, uh, it, you know, that's what a new investor wants to hear. And, and so I think, obviously, the, the best med tech investors know exactly how to do this. But I have experienced this, and it is, man, when you, get, when you don't know what you're doing with your insiders, it's a mess. I, yeah, I think, and you're not, you're probably not going to have it 100% sorted out when you first start raising money because you don't know exactly, you know, where the uh, total uh, raise is going to come out and all that. But you should uh, have had the conversation with each of your investors to at least get a general sense of what, you know, uh, what their participation will be so that when you get the question from the new investor, you can give them some kind of an answer uh, rather than, you know, I don't know or they're not going to participate. Um, let's go to IPO because, you know, the valuation you're going to be looking for is going to be determined by the exit. And that math has changed. And so, you know, first, uh, maybe Dan, Dan, speak to what you think. I mean, look, I, what, you know, Tuesday in March is not the IPO market. It's going to change. But what do you think that looks like now in, you know, the kind of two thir 2023 and beyond? What, what do you need to be? Yeah, so I, I think we're going back to what was, you know, pre-2020 in terms of, uh, contours needed, right? And typically that's been 30 million of run rate revenue and then just an ability to, to accurately forecast. So the whole beat and raise guidance thing is, is really important. If you kind of historically look at the, the pre-2020 uh, pre IPO classes, you know, over $30 million of run rate revenue has shown aftermarket performance of extreme success. Below that, right, you, you could just talk to any CFO. It's really hard to predict uh, forecast and guide the street. So on a quarter by quarter basis, you need to be able to show that 5 to 10% beat and on your annual guidance, you know, showing that you're raising expectations. Um, that, that historically was the key to success. Um, obviously, when the SPAC market came out, we had folks going out with, you know, little to no revenue, and that's really hard to predict. Um, there was a little bit of forgiveness with elective procedures um, being shut down during COVID, but generally speaking, Wall Street has reset thinking, and it, it, yeah, it goes to John's earlier point of kind of the reset of, of growth to value. And, um, you know, that's generally how we're, we're seeing folks think about it in, in terms of what the, you know, ramifications are and how they should be looking as a potential public company. Do you and, have just a quick question on that? Do you have um, um, thoughts about uh, cash burn or profitability metrics as it relates to an IPO? Does that matter? 
Yeah, so uh, I, again, I think um, it used to be, you know, revenue growth you know, um, presumes everything and, you know, just focus on that. I, that revenue growth is still extremely important, but what investors are looking for now from what we're hearing is, um, one, on gross margin, you need to give an understanding of what the optimal gross margin could look like for the business and kind of be on that track record for that. I think for an IPO, if you're under 50%, it gets a little challenging and you need to be able to guide the street to what optimal gross margin could look like. And then on profitability, it doesn't need to be tomorrow or next year, but there needs to be a line of sight. And I think, you know, over the last 24 months, um, that wasn't necessarily the case, but now folks are looking to just understand when that date could be and make sure that that's a measured and conservative approach and there, there's a line of sight to it. I have a thought on that. That prompted a thought, which is even when it comes to raising private capital, uh, you know, when you're raising money um, for your company over time through the earlier rounds of financing through product development and clinical trials and regulatory and reimbursement, you know, and all of that, um, the things that you need to know really well are, are different. You know, you need to know what your, uh, you know, your patent uh, position is and your product and, and, you know, the clinical data and all that, of course. Um, but as you get to more growth financing where you're starting to get more into commercialization, it's really important for you to understand the commercialization metrics that are uh, going to be important that investors are looking at at that stage of the business. So, you know, kind of the bottoms up analysis of like, you know, how many reps do you need and what's their uh, the productivity per rep and, you know, all of those kinds of uh, numbers. Um, so just when you go, go out to raise money, think about uh, if you're what stage the business is at and make sure you, you know, kind of know that part of it well. And, and I'll just, um, I think we, also, before we leave the topic, SPACs, because I'm sure there's been a lot of conversation about that, but uh, that's an enormously evolved uh, marketplace. I think you got to be very careful about what you're considering. Many, many of those trusts are empty, and they're not assets. They're, it, they're almost liabilities in some, some regards because other than Orchestra Biomedical, which is a Dan and my firm probably the success in the last 12 months, you know, but tremendous business, you know, partners, tremendous, you know, new business model, well financed, great opportunities. That was a different matter. But nonetheless, what we saw two years ago were two valuation markets emerge what the real world would pay and then what the SPAC world would pay. And that never really existed. There are not two worlds for valuation. There's one. And they were going to merge, and they weren't going to merge in the middle. The SPAC market was going to collapse on top of the IPO market, and it has happened. And so now you've got, you don't have that, that valuation opportunity. The, the capital probably isn't in those trusts. So I think they become vehicles, but you got to be really careful what what you ask for, and it you got to have you got to not have enough capital. And you know, I think that's what we took into account. I think orchestras, you know, thus shining star in the entire capital markets because we thought about that pretty hard, and uh, and so it can be a vehicle. But I think what it was two years ago is probably gone. So uh, I don't know, Dan, if you have anything else, but. It, it can be an enormous waste of time for a private company to go down that path if you don't really know what you're asking for. Yeah, I think that's well said. And the only thing I'd add on to it is that uh, the SEC is a heightened focus on it. So even if you announce a deal, it's six months thereafter than when it'll eventually close. And markets can certainly change. A lot of things can happen. So as you're starting to pursue certain options, um, just keep that in mind, right? You can you know, strike something on paper with a SPAC, but it could be you know, many months. So raising a private round might not be uh, a, wall, a worse alternative because at the end of the day, it could take you know, six to eight months from the time you actually ink an LOI with a SPAC to actually getting uh, money in the bank. So we've been here before. We're going to be here again. But you know, this, these don't last forever if you've been around long enough. Be, but you know, I think we've got, we've got some waters to kind of to get through. But maybe for fun, John, like, what, what's really, what are the big themes? What is really investable? What do you think is really working? Uh, inside MedTech, what, what categories? Yeah, I don't know that I have uh, category like therapeutic categories or uh, you know clinical categories. I think it's more of kind of the fundamentals of um, 
you know, that we think about that, uh, uh, that make a good investment. So it's, you know, uh, things like uh, a big market and uh, a product that makes a big difference in the patients that it's treating and, you know, solid clinical data and, you know, all, all uh, those kinds of basic metrics, um, good management, et, et, et cetera, that um, are the things that we really look at. We're not looking specifically, you know, we're not zeroed in specifically on cardiology or orthopedics or whatever, you know, the case may be because there's good investments to be had across the spectrum of, of, uh, of areas of healthcare. Dan, any thoughts? Yeah, um, so I think, you know, those parameters certainly make sense and hold true kind of across most VCs and strategics. Um, I think two areas that, that come up uh, quite frequently is clinical decision support and remote patient monitoring. Um, I think that's an area for strategics where they see a, uh, you know, that technology, um, some some folks do better than others. So if you're able to do that as an early stage company and be a little bit more nimble, I think they, they see that as, you know, um, great revenue synergies, cost synergies. Um, and the other piece is um, when folks think about services, they almost think of it as almost an annual renewable and similar to consumables. As we start to move to a potentially more recessionary phase of the economy, capital equipment comes a little less in favor with the large strategics. So if you're able to give a, some type of service offering, pay-per-click, um, that, that, um, that holds really well in those conversations when they're having their uh, investment committee meetings. Yeah, and I, I think I couldn't agree with you more, John, and there are great investment opportunities we're seeing across the board, If whether it's robotics or structural heart or uh, you know, patient monitoring is a mega theme. Uh, you know, there, there's just so many. But if you look at it, you know, we just roll in the United States. We're going to spend four and a half trillion dollars this year, and three and a half trillion of dollars of that is labor. So, one, if labor doesn't play into your theme, you better figure that out, <laughs> because either you know, eliminating you know visits to hospital or readmissions, or labor some somewhere. I think that's that's the that is really the opportunity for the old, there is unlimited opportunity in the med tech industry for arresting that three and a half trillion because that's, that is there, it's not gonna go down, but it can, it can shift. And I think that's, to me, why I'm so optimistic really about the next 10 or 20 years, all these things are, are gonna be tremendous drivers of growth for, for the med tech industry. Yeah, I um, think that, that's key and it's been, been the case for a while, but continues to be, which is taking cost out of the healthcare system is is super valuable and, and important. That's a key part of our investing thesis. And um, so it used to be the case you develop a new product and you charge more for it and you tell your customers that they're gonna save money over five years or something like that. You know, that doesn't really work anymore. You need to generate an ROI immediately now. So, um, you know, whatever you provide needs to be less expensive than the alternative, you know, right? up front and you know I think that makes it much more attractive so any questions we we avoided the bank <laughs> the <laughs> bank question uh, any questions for the audience while we we have a few minutes Yeah, I, I, generally it, it tends to vary on what type of transaction, but if you're talking about maybe a private capital raise, um, you know, during the height of things we were seeing um, raises be able to be executed within three months. I think now it's probably closer to six months, uh, and sometimes it's a bit longer. It, it, everything's always um, situation specific in terms of um, where a company's at in their, in their capital cycle and what the insiders are. Um, are, are composed of, right? Obviously, if it's a, if it's a founder-owned business and it's the first institutional capital, that tends to take a little bit longer, but if there's already institutional capital within the capital structure, they, um, you know, there's a easier way of people opening up doors, et cetera. So it, it varies, but that's just a general parameter. Is that helpful? And, and I think that extra three months is one reticence of, you know, there's just a, there's cautionary environment, but I think valuation, I'll come back to what I said before. Um, you know, I have fielded a lot of calls where from well-known VCs that say, John, really like this. I've followed this for a long time. I just don't want to embarrass the company and with my, my term sheet. That tells you something. So I think th that's what you don't want to spend six months figuring out. You know, take your medicine if it, I, mean, I hate to say it that way, but that, that is, that, 
that can hurt you if you if you just play it out too long. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Um, but I think uh, another thought is just to, to do your best to try to understand what's going on with the investor because, uh, you know, investors get really busy. I mean, uh, uh, I was working, you know, kind of 24-7 on an acquisition financing for the two weeks um, up until a week ago. And then the last week I've been spent uh, trying to finance uh, one of our existing portfolio companies. And so the last three weeks I just haven't had a chance to kind of think about anything other than those um, two projects. Uh, and so frequently, uh, investors won't engage on an opportunity really just because they're busy. And so, um, you know, when you, uh, when you do in talk to them, you know, I would encourage you to try to dig into that and understand a little better, like, okay, are you not engaging with us now because you're just too busy and we should, you know, uh, you know, come back to you in a certain amount of time or, you know, is it not a fit? And if it's not a fit, just let me know so I don't waste my time. Yeah, and I, I think the other thing too, right? Um, investment committee meetings are a lot easier when all the stocks are going up, yeah. right? So now <laughs> everything is, uh, you know, you have to be really buttoned up. There's extra committee meetings, et cetera. So there's just um, the, the level of diligence that happened in 21 and 22 was a, a lot less than what we're seeing now. And that's just people generally be more conservative. I mean, we all are in our own lives. So it's, it's you know, it's only a natural expectation that uh, investment committees would be as well. All right. Really appreciate your attention, and, and thanks again to LSI for, for having us today. Appreciate, appreciate Thank you. everybody's time.